Today, we're outside the manor house, the soon to be former residents of Brother Paul Feeney. Brother Paul has been a member of the St. Charles community for well over 50 years and is a variant brother for over 60. However, Brother Paul will be departing the St. John's campus before the conclusion of this school year. Brother Paul is a teacher, a Zavarian brother, and most of all, a friend. He has a lifetime of experiences to share with us, and today he's inviting us to hear what is just a small portion of that. So join us as we come here about the early days of St. John's, the Zavarian brothers, and most importantly, the man himself, Brother Paul. So, Brother Paul, if you could tell us maybe a little bit about what your childhood was like, where you were born, uh, about the times that you were born in, what your school life was like. I was born in 1933, um, the first of two children, my parents, John and Gertrude, they married in 1931. Uh, my father had uh, gone to law school, actually uh, got a degree law school, but it was the Depression, and uh, he had to get a, a real job. So he spent uh, 44 years uh, with the New England Telephone Company. Uh, my mother was a, a homemaker, and uh, as I say, I was born in 1933, was during the Depression, and two years later, my sister Marion was, uh, was born. So just the two of us. I went to school when I was five years old. Um, I graduated from high school at 17. In fact, I was 16 up until February of my senior year. I went to uh, St. Peter's Grammar School. Uh, they have to realize that the world in the 1930s and late 40s was quite different from the world today. Everybody went to church, everybody. In fact, the 1130 Mass not only was there a packed upstairs church, packed downstairs church, but also packed school auditorium, people going to mass. There were uh, there were five priests in the uh, in the parish. Uh, but Senior Haviland was the pastor, and then we had four curates. Most of the kids went to Catholic school. Uh, I got into BC High out of the eighth grade. During the time I was in the eighth grade, I, uh, I became an altar boy, as many did. I was selected to, to be in the, uh, the choir. We had a boys' choir of about 18 kids. I was, uh, I guess I had a pretty good voice. My voice isn't so hard anymore, but I get into plays, grad school, because I could sing, mostly uh, the singing roles. I was Hansel and Hansel and Gretel. Remember that as one other thing. So, yeah, that's that's what I did. Then, of course, uh, I hung, hung around with the kids in the neighborhood. I was a kind of normal, natural Catholic upbringing. You went into my house and you saw religious art. Not overwhelming, but there was always a. Uh, when you come into the the house, there was a picture of the Sacred Heart. In each bedroom, there was a crucifix. There was uh, maybe some small uh, object. It was kind of a sacred place. Even I, as a kid, I understood. Uh, every night, the whole family uh, knelt down on our knees to say the rosary, uh, five decades of the rosary. And though I wanted to get to town field and see a ball game, you know, there was no moving out of the house for any reason. My upbringing was rather typical of other uh, families. No, this was a kind of uh, spiritual voice with the St. Peter's Parish. I went to PCI, I didn't get a, a scholarship. They, uh, the eighth grade teacher was always trying to uh, win scholarships to PCI, full scholarships and not scholarships. And I didn't make it, but I got into PCI. The first year at PCI was uh, the disaster for me because I came down in the middle of the year with something called scarlet fever. It was a uh, contagious disease, uh, which meant you had to be quarantined. I remember 
a big uh, Q cut, a card with a big Q. And uh, that was put in the window next to the front door so that nobody can come in and see me. So I was out of, out of school for three weeks, three and a half, maybe a maybe four. When I get the, over the scarlet fever, I was allowed to, to return to school. I had fallen back tremendously. There was, I guess there was tough love in those days, you know. Well, let, pull up your socks and get with the program. Uh, and uh, I get li little sympathy from, from teachers. The passing mark at BC High in those days, 1946, was 60. I think I did 60 and everything practical. Uh, I didn't feel anything, but I was very, very discouraged. So I decided that I ought to change uh, schools. So uh, I talked it over with my father. Mission High School was in Roxbury. A lot of my pals from St. Kingdoms were going to, to Mission High School. And it was conducted by the Zaverian Brothers. I, I had no knowledge of the Zaverian Brothers, only through the kids I hung around with. They were always talking about the Rhodes. I guess that's what piqued my interest. My freshman year, as I say, was a disaster. My father said, go to the sophomore year at BCI, and if you don't like it, after six months, you can, you can transfer it. I got into the sophomore year, and I had a priest, one of the Jesuit priests. His name was Father John Dustin Kelly. And he was, he was my savior. All the kids liked him because he was, he was tough, but he was very fair, and he was very compassionate. He was very compassionate. Uh, but he didn't fall around in his classes. Uh, and he taught Greek. I enjoyed going to, to his class. Now, he taught also religion. Uh, and uh, so I think he was the one that got me interested in teaching, to being a teacher. I just loved the way he taught. And, you know, it was a new language and a new vocabulary, new letters you had to learn and so forth and so on. And I, I kind of began to flourish again. I went into the Juby year, and I had a, a priest by the name of Father Frank Scannell. Now, Father Frank Scannell was always talking about the Severian brothers, although he was a Jesuit. Uh, and he talked about the Severian brothers precisely because he had gone to a school that we operated in Somerville called St. Joseph's Sprammer School. He was always talking about the, the wonderful work the Severian brothers did. You know? So that really got me interested in who are these Zaverian brothers, because my pals, they talk about the brothers, and they had really seen for like the brothers. It seems like on a whim, I decided I think I'm going to go over to Mission High and talk to one of the brothers. I don't know anything about them, but I think I'll go over there. So I don't know where I got the courage to do this. You know, it should have been probably just a thought, a dazzling thought. But well, I actually went over it and saw him. And uh, that brother was named Brother Rabon, R-A-M-O-N. And uh, he later went back to his family name, uh, Brother Peter Kelly. Well, he was the first Severian brother I ever met. And I've often said he's the best Severian brother. He walked with a limp because he had polio when he was the Einstein. And uh, he had to wear a brace the rest of life. He was so full of joy, so full of happiness, so full of enthusiasm. He was the one who guided me into the Severi Brothers. I just took a, a kind of leap of a dog, you know. I didn't know who they were. Uh, one of my pals also joined the Severian Brothers, but one of my grammar school pals, Tommy Donlin, and Tommy became Brother Bertrand, and uh, He's dead now, but for years, uh, he taught here at St. John's High School. He was a gregarious kind of guy. He loved people, people loved him. But anyway, Tommy and I went off uh, uh, with 33 other young men, some from Kentucky, some from Maryland, many from New York, Massachusetts, and whatnot, and I 
arrived at All Point Comfort, Virginia, uh, to begin uh, the visit. When I was at BC Hyde, I was scared to the the rule was you got to do three hours of homework because we had Latin, and you got two set two marks of Latin, Latin composition and Latin literature, Greek composition, Greek literature, English composition, English literature, U.S. history, math. Uh, maybe there were other things, but they expected three hours of homework at night. So I had to travel by streetcar and bus to get to BCI from Dorchester. It was a, I don't know how long it took, took to get, get to school and to come home from school, but it was a journey, you know. It, when I came home from school, it was around five o'clock at night. And uh, three hours of homework, I had to do that because I was afraid I'm gonna flick out. So I didn't get into any activities, although Father Blatchford, who was the track coach, kept telling me I would be terrific at the hurdles, you know, but I said, if I spend time with track and then have to travel a, you know, by streetcar and train and bus to get home at night and do three hours, I can't do it. So as much as I wanted to do it, I said, I, I just don't think I could do it. A fellow student, he had a, a, a spot in a play. The play was Osnick and Old Lace. Uh, and he was one of the policemen in the play. And uh, so I thought the kid remembered that I had been in plays in uh, grammar school. And they said, I know somebody you could learn what nine lines and uh, take Officer Klein's plays of the play. So uh, the priest, Father Mulcahy, came up and said, I understand you've been in plays in grammar school. Do uh, you think you could uh, do a policeman in, the, in a play? But got nine lines to say. I said, I think I could do it. And I liked it very much. And I felt very comfortable. And so I stuck with dramatics. Okay, so I was in plays in my junior year, my senior year, and uh, this is uh, uh, vain boasting, I guess, but I won a prize. It wasn't the super prize, but uh, we had a play, uh, a play called uh, uh, Brother Arthur. Uh, it was made into a movie starring Humphrey Bogart and Edward G. Robinson. And it's about the you know, gangsters who hide out in, in a monastery to uh, to avoid the police. Nobody, nobody will ever think of going to the Trappist Monastery in Spencer to find a crook, you know, and he'll play the part of a monk and all that stuff. Anyways, it's a funny, kind of funny play. So I got the uh, the part as a, the novice master. So I had to instruct the crooks. <laughs> When they came out to the, to, as a senior, when they came to hand out the prizes, uh, I got the best prize for the support, the best supporting actor prize, you know, which isn't the top prize, but I was thrilled. And uh, I know my parents, my sister were very, very proud of me. And so after I went into the brothers, did I see a plan for God, uh, from God? Uh, no, I didn't see a plan from God. I think I intuited a plan from God. A, a friend of mine, his name is Jim Walcott. Uh, he's connected with uh, my brother's keeper down in uh, the town of North Easton. And he said something to me that he put in a little uh, handout that he uh, worked on. And I'd just like to read it. He said, we do not see God's plan by looking ahead. We do not see God's plan by looking ahead. We see God's plan for our lives most clearly in retrospect by looking behind us. So as I look at my life from behind, I look in behind, I see God's plan. Huh? If I hadn't got the scholar fever, I would never have become a very broke. If I had uh, been a whiz kid uh, in freshman year, I would never have met Father uh, John Dustin Kelly, and I probably wouldn't have taken up teaching. But that's all part of God's plan. So that's about uh, how I became a very brother. 
You know, it's all mysterious. It's all mysterious. All right, so Brother Barton told us story about how religion plays a stink apart to your upbringing. Um, did that influence you at all to pursue your vocation? Yes. Uh, you use the word vocation. Um, vocation is a calling. Vocal cords, vocation. So somebody calls you. Um, I believe I was called by God to at least try religious life. The calling is, uh, it's a very subtle kind of thing. And you only can see it more clearly in retrospect when you look behind you, okay? It's like a, a small, quiet voice, a whisper, you know? You could do this. I think you've got to follow this road. It's, it's a very kind of subtle thing. But you don't choose your vocation. God chooses you. Um, in the 15th chapter of John's Gospel, verse 16, verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus goes on to say, I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last. I believe that kind of summar summarizes what a vocation is all about. It, it may look as though I chose to join the Severian brothers and that's partially true. But it's also true, and much more true, that God whispered to me, so to speak, uh, put thoughts into my mind, uh, attractions. I talked about the teaching attraction from Father Kelly. I talked about um, Brother Ramon, Brother. Uh, Brother Peter Kelly, the first brother I ever met, and the best brother I ever met. Um, and that whole community at Mission High School uh, was so welcoming for me. So I decided, much to my parents and my sister's chagrin, that I was going to try this. And I really surprised myself. I mean, when I look back on it, I said, no. I don't think, I don't think, uh, you know, you might not do it the second time around. I don't know. But anyway, that's what I did. I joined, I took a uh, train from South Station in Boston with a group of other people who were going to Linda Michade. Uh, several from Walling Catholic. One, Tommy Donlin, who was a grammar school uh, chum of mine. And uh, he went to Mission High School and I went to BCI. But we both decided we we're going to go into the Zimmerian brothers. And we had you hadn't decided decided that together. We decided that separately. So I went by train down to Baltimore, and then we got on a boat. After having supper in Baltimore, we got on a boat and went to Norfolk, Virginia. And we got off at Norfolk and were met by the novice master and the superior of the novitiate community, and we were driven to the novitiate, which was called Old Point Comfort College, now known as Sacred Heart Novitiate. It had been a, a school, a high school, uh, back in the early 1900s that the brothers operated. I may have mentioned that all Point Comfort, or Point Comfort, was the site, and I didn't know this at the time, that the first African slaves arrived in the United States in 1519. Uh, 
I don't want to sound melodramatic, but even from the first day, I knew this is where God wanted me. And I've never, I've never uh, looked back. I've never had really any doubts that this is where I belong. I've seen people c come, try out uh, the novitiate and leave. Uh, 33 young men entered on September 19th, 1950. By the time it was time to take first vows, we were down to 21. So some came, stayed a few days, and said, ah, this isn't for me. But I, I don't know, I felt so at home. I didn't know anybody, you know, but I felt so at home and so welcome. The novice master, Brother Kevin, was wonderful. Um, the superior of the house, Brother Nathan, who was a principal at St. John's in the 30s and 40s, and was a teacher here when I first began to teach in the 1950s. He was just wonderful, too. And we had another a brother, Brother Oswald, who was our postulant master. Now, let me explain to you what a postulant is. A postulant is one who comes and tries, the, before entering the novitiate, tries the life for six months. So from September 19th, to March 19th of uh, 1951, uh, we had this period where we learned something about religious life. We learned something about um, the Zaverian brothers, the history of the Zaverian brothers, because there were a lot of kids that went to Zaverian brothers' school, the group, schools that really didn't know the history. They knew certain brothers, but they didn't know the history of the brothers. So that was what Brother Oswald uh, uh, instructed us in. And then on the 19th of September, 1951, uh, we pronounced vows. I can't remember just how many people, but there was under 20 that uh, pronounced first vows. And so from, September, from March 19th, 1951 to September of 1953, we were in the novitiate in Virginia. In September of 1953, uh, no, September 52, I guess it was, we moved as novices to our, what we call scholasticate, our school. We operated a junior college called Severian College, located in Silver Spring, Maryland. We started that college in the early 1930s. It was mainly to educate our own brothers, but after a while, other religious orders, uh, really small religious orders, sent uh, their, their uh, novices and their scholastics to the college. So when I got there, uh, I spent the first semester of my freshman year in college at Silver Spring, Maryland, at Severian College. Then in January, January 19th, we went back to the novitiate. I was still a novice. I went back to the novitiate in Virginia, prepared for two months to take the vows and then pronounce vows on September 19th, I'm sorry, March 19th, 1950 to a uh, time. The exact date, but anyway, uh, and then returned to college and uh, spent the next uh, three and a half years studying at our college through the sophomore year. At the end of the sophomore year, we moved to Catholic University. It took our third and fourth years in Washington, D.C., uh, the Catholic University of America, and I majored in uh, United States history. So I, and I took uh, other courses that were connected with history. I took several college geography courses, uh, political science courses, sociology courses, uh, Latin American history, that was my minor. Um, and so I was preparing myself to go out, as we say, on the missions uh, to my first assignment. 
uh, I loved my four years of college. They were just wonderful years. Uh, lots of study, but there were all kinds of people uh, that, uh, that helped one another. The, the, the most important thing I learned about the Zaverian brothers was community and friendship, okay? You have to, the text says you have to lay down your life for your friends. That means nobody can be a brother or a priest who wants to get married. You know, you might want to, but if you want to, you're not going to be accepted into it. That, that's the rule of the church, you know? And there's some pretty good reasons for that, although I'm quite open to the idea of a married priest. Uh, but uh, I have the freedom to move around. If I had a wife and children, they might not like to move every so often to Maryland or England or Kenya, or, you know? But I can do that because I'm... But the most important thing is the word brother. We call it the Severian brothers. And that's what we are. We're brothers to one another. That's the most important thing. Community, prayer light is the most important thing. What we do as a ministry is important, but not as important as our prayer life, our worship of God, and our living together as brothers in a community. Okay, the, uh, let me say one last thing. When living together as brothers in community, we are not carbon copies of one another. We all have different personalities, backgrounds, you know. So you learn to love one another. Uh, you learn to accept one's differences uh, as people will accept my differences. Uh, so that 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 was uh, that was the preparation during the uh, 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 recreation time. I think I mentioned that uh, I uh, I took up uh, refereeing basketball games. We had a, a league composed of various religious orders that sent their candidates, uh, their scholastics, to a Catholic university. So the Paulists sent a team. The um, Augustinians had a team. Um, the uh, Holy Cross Fathers had a tea, the Christian Brothers had a tea. There were, it was a league. And uh, probably some of the, the most fiercely contested games were run among people who were vowing to follow Christ. <laughs> but that didn't preclude them from pushing, shoving, elbowing, trying to get a basket, you know. Um, but it was all good fun. It was all good fun. The competition was keen, but in the end, it was all good fun. So that's uh, mainly what I did. I, I spent most of my time studying, okay? Which led to my first assignment. But before I got to, to St. John's, I went to Camp Callet, which is located in, uh, in Maryland, Leningtown, Maryland, southern part of Maryland. We had a boys' camp that we operated for a number of years. And uh, I spent eight weeks there uh, in a cabin with another brother. And um, I forget how many boys were in the cabin, but they were probably uh, seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, and that was for eight weeks. Well, that was giving me a little uh, experience with dealing with young people, you know, before I set put at St. John's with freshmen, I had younger people to deal with. Um, but that was a lot of fun. And, uh, and so I, uh, on August 15th of uh, 1956, we had the reading of the assignments at Camp Calvin. And they would say, St. John's High School, Worcester, cross off brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so, and add brother Antoninus and brother Kelly. So I ought to uh, explain to you why I said brother Antoninus. When I was in the novitiate, 
We are all given new names, names of saints. They, uh, and we gave up our old identity for a new identity. Uh, St. Peter was called Cephas, uh, and uh, Jesus changed his name to Peter. Um, or Simon Peter. Anyway, that was a tradition in the religious life, not just the Zaverian brothers, the Dominican fathers, you know, so many other groups, the Christian brothers. Uh, so I was given the name. I didn't choose it. Uh, it was chosen for me. I have not chosen you. You have chosen me. The same thing worked with the name. So I was given the name of Brother Antoninus, which was a mouthful. Uh, let me explain what that word means. It means little Anthony. So Anton is the, is the Anthony, okay? And the I-N-U-S is a diminutive. In other words, it means little Anthony. Uh, so if you say Marcel and you put I in you, it becomes Marcelinus, okay? Little Marcel. No, although I was six, two and a half at the time, uh, and little Anthony, the little part of Anthony, of Antoninus, didn't fit. Uh, that's the name I was given. And what a wonderful name. I, I pray to St. Antoninus every night. He was, the, he was a Dominican friar. He was the Archbishop of Florence, Italy. And uh, he lived in the 15th century. He was uh, dedicated uh, to the poor of Florence. He owned practically nothing. He used to, if, if somebody gave him stuff, he gave it away. He was also a moral theologian. And uh, so I was kind of proud of that. And then I found out that, um, that our former uh, deceased now, a Supreme Court judge, Antonin Scalia, was little Anthony without the U.S. out. Antonin. Huh? And then Antonin Dvorak was a very famous uh, composer of music. Okay. Uh, so that there are other people whose names were Antoninus. Okay. Or variations. Of. So I bore that name as I came to St. John's in 1956. So when I got here, I was known as Brother Antoninus, as I've said. Uh, it was a mouthful. Uh, the kids were able to uh, easily s say Brother Neil, he was here, and Brother Lionel, I wasn't too odd. Brother Chad, he was principal. Uh, Brother Ricardo, I wasn't too bad. But Brother Antoninus was was a bit much for some people because many kids got it right right away. I tried to explain it, but um, the school janitor couldn't understand who I was at all, and so instead of calling me Brother Antoninus, he called me Brother Antermine, which uh, was the uh, syrup you put on pancake, you know, the uh, uh, pancake mix of the syrup. And then somebody else called me Brother Antonius and said, Thank be to God, we now have a Lithuanian brother on the, on the faculty at St. John's. I thought they were all Irishmen, but uh, we now have a Lithuanian. And I guess Antonius is a Lithuanian name. Um, so I got a big kick out of that, too. We had two Dodge station wagons. And... We put six brothers in one station wagon and six in the other. They were, we didn't have bucket seats in those days, so you could fit packs in three people up front if you squeeze them in. Three in the middle, and there was, there was a back seat that looked out on the traffic behind. And so there were two seats there. And uh, so I, being the youngest, rode shotgun, as we say, uh, looking at the traffic uh, behind the car. Uh, and that's how we got to St. John's down at Temple Street. When it snowed, um, we
We didn't have any plows. We didn't have any money to get plows. So it was plowing by hand, uh, shuttles. And uh, thank God there were at least five guys who were in their 20s or early 30s uh, were able to shovel the snow from the door here to the road. The man across the street, Mr. Phillips, used to come and help us out. His son, Richie Phillips, uh, was a freshman at St. John's, and uh, Richie is, was always a great pal of mine. He died uh, two years ago, uh, and uh, I miss seeing him. I used to walk over here in his 70s, uh, walking around in the evening. We had mass here every day, except Sundays. Every day, we had mass in the chapel, which is the sun porch. And uh, priests from St. Mary's used to come and say mass, alternating, the pastor and the curate. And uh, the same thing is true of St. Anne's, although the pastor didn't, show, didn't come, really, the curate from St. Anne's time. But they alternated. But on Sundays, we had to get down to, to St. Mary's. And we all look forward to going to St. Mary's because the two priests at St. Mary's, they were just absolutely wonderful. Father Ed Lynch, he was the pastor. Now, this is 1956. And it hit the young curate, his name was Father Bernie Gilgut, uh, who was a diocesan priest. He had started out as an Augustinian, but a transfer to the diet, a bishop Wright uh, brought it into the diocese. And he was just a, a newly ordained priest a couple of years. But Father Bernie Gilgun was an absolutely marvelous priest. Um, he gave the best sermons you could ever hear, and he did, did it in seven minutes. Uh, not only did he appeal to your mind, he, he aimed straight for your heart, and his eyes and your heart were connected. And this is not just my opinion. It's the opinion of the brothers, and it's the opinion of, of the uh, parishioners at St. Mary's. He was just great. He was a big influence in my life, although he did not know it at the time. As I say, I was captivated by his love of, uh, his love of God, his ability to preach, to teach. In 1956 and 1957, he was in the middle of the church as Father Lynch was saying mass, and there was time for him. He was in the middle aisle urging people to, to sing. Don't be afraid to sing. Sing loudly. Huh? You're in God's house, you know. Sing as though you were in a Bible. You know, sing, sing. Let God be your voice. He was just absolutely wonderful. He was just, and this is before Pope John the 23rd called the Vatican Council. This was before Vatican Council. He had the church hardly. And every couple of weeks, he, he conducted, for anybody who wanted to experience it, um, what he called clarification of thought. In other words, parishioners were invited if they wanted to come on a Friday night to talk about the church. And he would, uh, he would sometimes uh, talk about a book he had just read. He was a very learned person, too, a very down-to-earth, practical, learned person. So he so it inspired me uh, that I decided that I knew not, no longer going to pursue a career in U.S. history. I am going to go into theology. One of the things that I learned from Bertie Kilgun was who Dorothy Day was. Dorothy Day was the, the co-founder of what we call the Catholic Work. Uh, it's a movement started by Dorothy and a, and a French peasant who once was a Christian brother by the name of Peter Moran. And they started this in New York City in 1933, in the depths of the Depression. They started a soup kitchen in Manhattan, and they also started 
uh, a newspaper called The Catholic Worker, selling for a penny a column. And if you get The Catholic Worker today, 2022, it's still a penny a copy. If you want to get a year subscription, it's a quarter. Now, isn't that a bug? In today's inflation? Sure is. And so he inspired me to study for my master's degree uh, theology. And then I became very much interested in Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker movement. And uh, we do have a two Catholic worker houses in Worcester. And uh, one of them, I, I, I brought this. One of them is called um, the St. Francis and St. Therese um, Catholic Worker. It's run on at 52 Mason Street in Worcester, um, off Chandler Street. And it's been run for years by a couple, uh, Claire and Scott Shaper Duffy. Uh, Scott was a graduate of Holy Cross. And uh, they have been uh, taking care of uh, homeless people uh, for years, for years. Huh? The, other, the other one is uh, the mustard seed. Huh? And the mustard seed is located on Piedmont Street in Worcester. And it serves meals to homeless people or people who just can't afford food every day, every day. And um, that's run by White Boova. And wouldn't you know that this weekend we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Muspin Seed. Uh, and Bernie Gill Gunn, my hero, the one who changed the course of my, my educational life, uh, was the chaplain of the Muspin Seed for years before he died. And um, it's interesting that at the conference up at Holy Cross, I spent the, the weekend at Holy Cross, the, um, uh, I met Dorothy Day's granddaughter, Martha Ennessy, and had a wonderful chat with her. And I also met two graduates of St. John's High School, I'm sure it's pretty, um, Steve Moran, class of the uh, 1964, and Rich Bishop, the class of 1970. Rich runs the Catholic Worker Farm out in Montana, and has the years. Uh, and uh, so it was, a, it was a delight, a surprise and delight to meet two graduates of St. John's who have been longtime Catholic workers. One of the things I probably should mention, uh, in 1958, when I was teaching at St. John's, um, I wrote a book. I co-authored a book called by this uh, racist title, which I didn't invent, publish it in, Friar Among Savages. And, and it was published in 1958. It's described as a, a, a series for readers between nine to the teens. So it was a series of books put out by a publisher called Benzica Brothers uh, on Catholic heroes of the past. So I was asked by one of our brothers, my senior year in college, to co-author a book uh, for this series. The other brother, Brother Kurt, uh, really Ed Bozzo, um, and I, sat down and wrote the book. I was the historian. I tried to get all the historical information about the, the person I was writing about, and Ed did the literary, and I wrote some of it, but uh, Ed was the real English major. Uh, so we, we, uh, we uh, wrote the book, and it came out in 1958. And uh, you could see I was, I was kind of a young guy in those days, <laughs> the two of us. Um, and that was, that was, that was kind of nice. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, Worcester Telegram and Gazette came out and took a picture and wrote a little article. The Catholic Free Press uh, did the same thing. And uh, some of the boys uh, 
bought the book. <laughs> I was in the selling it. They had to get it from, uh, you know, a uh, bookstore. But uh, that that is kind of interesting. But the subject matter of the of the book was a Dominican priest by the name of Father Louis Cancer, C A N C E R. He was a Dominican uh, friar who was very successful in converting the Guatemalan Indians to Christianity. But the way he did it was by very non-vital means. He was very gentle, persuaded people. If they didn't want to join, uh, convert to Christianity, that was fine with him. And so, but he was very, very good. He was so good that the Dominicans said, we want you to go to Florida and do the same thing with the Florida Indians. So he uh, accepted that assignment and he went to Florida, but he had been preceded by some of the conquistadores, uh, the Soto being one of them, and they brutalized the Indians. So when he got there and tried to talk about Christianity, their idea of Christianity was the Soto and, and these brutal people that were trying to subjugate them. So he was not very successful. In fact, he tried his gentle, nonviolent uh, means, and uh, it didn't bear fruit. He was clung to death on the shore of uh, the Gulf of Mexico in Florida uh, by the Indians. And the people, the people that had came Tame with him, uh, brought him by ship, uh, wrote Mahaba, urging him to take a rope out out to the big ship. And he said, no, my mission was to the Indians. I am going to stick with the Indians. Uh, I should call them the Native Americans, but Indians is bad enough. Uh, calling them savages is, but I didn't choose the type. In 1958, we didn't have uh, any sensitivity, I guess, uh, to uh, uh, Native Americans. And referring to the as savages is horrifying to me. And, uh, but in 1958, I guess it wasn't horrifying. Less of me is. Um, we learned by making horrible mistakes, I guess. Most horrible mistakes is not learning by mistakes. Okay, Brother Paul, in the mid-1960s, you were working at Zaverian College in Maryland. Can you tell us a little bit about the social issues at the time and how the students became involved in them? The 1960s, uh, I've turned it the best of times and the worst of times. The worst of times was the country was in, in chaos and turmoil. All kinds of revolutions were going on and student uh, protests and strikes and all kinds of damage to property and so forth and so on. That was the worst of times. But it was also the best of times, in my opinion, because young people began to think about what's going on in our country, what's going on in our world, what's with this Vietnam War? Especially young people who said, I may be in Vietnam before I know it. You know, I'm 16, 17, or 18 years of age, and uh, I have to register for the draft, and I may be picked and given a rifle and said, go, say, go over to Vietnam and kill the opposition. So a lot of people were concerned. Uh, when I got down to Siberian College, our young brothers were very much involved in uh, the civil rights movement and in uh, protests against the, the Vietnam War. So as far as civil rights are concerned, uh, they, were, they wanted to be part of the civil rights movement. And uh, the civil rights leaders, Ralph Abernathy being one of them, the big civil rights leader, asked if some uh, shelters uh, could be constructed on our property in, in Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, Zaveri College. Well, uh, we said yes, 
And we didn't get a very, very uh, warm reception from neighbors who were saying, you know, that those brothers are bringing out all kinds of hippies and so forth and so on. Uh, but Luther King came one day and uh, uh, wanted to see what kind of other things were going on. There was going to be a poor people's march on Washington. And these uh, things were being constructed on our property were going to be transported down to Washington and uh, people could live in them, like lean-tos and so forth, the tents. So the, my young brothers were very, very much interested in that. Also, protests against the Vietnam War. And that was, that was uh, reflected in society. You know, high school and college students uh, wondered what this war is all about. You know, why are we in Vietnam? And uh, so uh, they, they were bringing me along. I was bringing them along. They were kind of bringing me along. In 1970, in June of 70, we had to close the college because the enrollment had gone down. And although we were, had uh, seminarians from other small religious orders coming for an education, this was a junior college, so ran. Financially, we couldn't afford it. The numbers had gone down and uh, we just couldn't afford to keep operating this junior college. So it closed in 1970. Well, I tried to get a, a, another college job and I couldn't. So I went back to high school. I went back to Severian Brothers High School in Westwood. And there I uh, was assigned to teach seniors, 1970-71 school year, seniors church history. Well, I did, th that really wasn't my field, let's say. I do something about theology and whatnot. It was one of the, the worst years of my life. I could not get the students to settle down and to concentrate. Kids were saying to me, well, I'm interested in church history. I don't care what happened in 300. I don't care what happened in 750 AD, you know? We're a now generation. And, uh, you know, I was showing my frustration, my anger, I suppose. And what kid said to me, does the church have anything to say about this war? And if it does, why didn't it teach that? So that was an idea that I took, thought about, and went to the headmaster and said, the student suggested that I teach something on the other war. Could I do it? And he said, yes. So that's when I started fashioning the course. And I called it Christian Attitudes Towards War and Peace. I stole the title of a book by a Quaker who taught at Yale Divinity School uh, in uh, New Haven. Uh, his name was uh, Roland Beaton. And uh, that's what I did. I started teaching about Christian attitudes towards war and peace. And I started to incorporate into this, uh, this course, films. I was getting uh, 16 millimeter films to uh, illustrate, you know, some of the aspects of uh, what I was talking about in the course. It began to, to grow. Kids seemed to be interested and uh, they liked all the visuals. And I just happened, so I said, let's keep going. Early in, uh, that year, 1970-71, a graduate of the school, a graduate who graduated from Zuverian Brothers High School, first graduating class, came up to me and said, would you help me? I have to go. I'm applying to be a conscientious objector uh, for the Vietnam War. And would you help me? Would you write a letter in support of me? Uh, would you come with me to the draft board? I suddenly happy to, who would be happy to. So that's what I did. Some of his rebel that stayed from Europe and uh, uh, they were caught up in, in drafts and so forth uh, and wars that didn't want to fight. So anyway, I wrote a statement and I accompanied him to the draft board. I sat in my black suit. I was not asked any questions. I was allowed to sit there and so I just sat there quietly and uh, 
three or four men, members of the draft board, quizzed him, and uh, he responded very, very nicely and so forth. And that was it. So they thanked him, they thanked me, and that, just, that was it. So I went back to his house, and uh, we were having, uh, you know, cookies and coffee and whatnot with his mother. And all of a sudden, George Sullivan, who was a judge, a famous judge, also an All-American uh, Notre Dame football player back in the mid-40s, uh, he had a couple of kids in school. He came bursting into the house and said, you got it, you got it. I was just thrilled. I was thrilled. I said to myself, this kid, who's now in his early 20s, he had this, a real understanding of what nonviolence is all about. He's willing to do alternative service. He's willing to go into the Peace Corps, and, but he doesn't want to learn how to, how to shoot guns and pe uh, kill people he, he has no quarrel with. So I'm teaching this course. It's 1974, I believe the year was 1974. And I'm uh, at a social, an evening social, and a lot of parents were there, and there was a parent who was uh, manning the, uh, the clocking uh, table. And I wondered over, or I didn't know her, and she wanted to know who I was and what I taught. And I said, well, I teach religion. Uh, and she said, oh, you teach religion. She said, you ought to come down to our parish. There's a fellow by the name of Charles McCarthy. He's a layman. And he is giving a course on Christian nonviolence. And I think you'd, you'd, you'd really enjoy it. So why don't you come down next week? So I said, okay. Well, I didn't. I forgot all about it. About a week later, I'm going from one part of the building to the other. I'm passing through the school office to get from one side to the other of the school. And standing at the counter was this woman, Pat Ferber, she remained was. And she liked it, and she said, I thought you said, we're going to come down to, to our parish and hear uh, Charles McCarthy. I said, oh, I forgot. Well, she said, don't forget. Don't forget. And um, he's very, very good. So I said, yes. Well, guess what? I forgot. A week or two later, I have a free period. I, I'm leaving the brother's house to go to a parking lot to get into a car to drive down to the post office to mail a letter. As I'm coming out the brother's uh, entrance to go to the car, a car comes up and parks at the curb, and out of the car is Pat Furbish. She said to me, you know, I'm really disappointed. I thought you were a man of your of all, a man of your word, and you didn't come. And I, you missed a, a golden opportunity. I said, "Well, I'll come. I really will come next week." He's not in our parish. He's, he's finished at our parish, but he's in another parish. Now you go to St. Joseph's in Nido, and you hear him. He'll he'll open your eyes and you know clear out your ears. So out of what we call human respect, because I didn't, I mean, God was sending her. I really believe that. This was no coincidence that I kept meeting her. So I, I went to St. Joe's Parish and didn't know anybody. There were about 15 people there. It was a dimly, dimly lit room on the basement of the school. I sat there. Uh, I was supposed to start at 7.30, 20 minutes to the 8, go side of Charles McCarthy. Quarter of egg, no show. Ten minutes of eight, I'm ready to leave. I'm getting up, and all of a sudden, he, sudden he walks in. And uh, so he said, let's get started. And so he's coughing, and clearing his throat. I'm saying to myself, oh, God, this is a, this speaker is just going to be terrible. Why not? I can't get up down. I can't I get up down. Well, he started to speak. And it's the only time in my life that I ever could not go to sleep at night. 
because what he had to say that night, and I can't repeat exactly what he said, all I know is what he had to say was so mind-blowing, can I use that word? I was thinking of what he said and the implications of what he said, and I was kind of wrestling in my mind with his ideas. I mean, the next day I must have been like a zombie going to the class because I had really had no sleep. And then I said to myself, I gotta, I gotta finish this. I gotta go back the next week. But already at St. Joseph's, we had gone four weeks. So I was in like week five of eight. Every, every out of Tuesday, let's say, he had something more interesting and more thought-provoking to say. So the thing happened. I said, I can hear the beginning of this. Are you ever going to go anyplace else to give this eight-week course? He said, yes, as a matter of fact, they're going out to the Worcester Diocese, to Southboro. There's a church out in Southboro, and I'm going to be starting next week or the week after. I said, I'll be there, and I'll bring two other brothers. So the three of us went out to Southboro and listened to the whole. Well, what did that do to my teaching? It enriched it, enlivened it. Uh, Charles McCarthy uh, was a layman. He dreamed of being a, a Marine Corps pilot until, uh, and he went to Notre Dame. He got a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree at Notre Dame, and he got a law degree from Boston College. And what happened was he was asked to start at the University of Notre Dame uh, the course on uh, nonviolence and conflict resolution. And that's what he did. Well, I won't get into the long story of why he left, but he came back to Massachusetts. He's a graduate of Malden Catholic, one of the, one of the Severian Brothers schools. And so I just changed the course. The focus was on theology. It was on uh, why you should be uh, thinking this way. It was all about putting on the mind of Christ. Get up. It's Christ in the Gospels, violent or non violent. Did he teach an ethic of violence or teach an ethic of non-violence? How about the apostles? How about the early church? How about Acts of the Apostles? How about the first three centuries of the church? And so forth. So I was digging and researching and so forth and so on. And, you know, the course exploded, you know, in the sense of by trying to make it better. A lot of kids didn't buy what I had to say, but that's okay. A lot of people didn't buy what Jesus had to say, but they heard. Say, so you can't reject something you've never heard. Say, so, so and that's the problem with the Catholic Church today, as far as teaching on on non violence. We don't teach it, uh, so we teach something called the just war theory, which is you know a theory that's got all kinds of it's like Swiss cheese. It's got loads of holes in it. John, John Lincoln Cotton was married. He had 12 kids. His 13th child died uh, about uh, eight hours after she was born. Uh, but he, he still has 12 kids. You know? So he raised, and his wife was from uh, Boston College, too. He met her at the at Boston College. So they raised a family of 12. One of the, the girls, Benedicta, swallowed a whole bottle of, uh, I think it was Tylenol, or uh, 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 some kind of aspirin, and her, her uh, liver and kidneys uh, got shot. I mean, she was in the Mass General, and it, 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 you know, she was ready to die. So everybody started praying for a miracle, and they prayed to a Jewish convert who became the kind of light nut her name was Edith Stein. And though, fact, though, though the fact that she was a Catholic Carmelite nun, she had Jewish blood in her, and she was arrested and deported to Auschwitz and was exterminated with her sister uh, in 1943. Uh, Edith Stein was, uh, was very, very important to the McCarthy family, so they prayed to Edith Stein. Well, guess what happened? She, she had turned yellow and blue and everything else like that. The doctors were practically giving up. And then they noticed a change. Three days, three days later, 
like Jesus in the tomb three days later. Three days later, she began to approve to the point where she could eat, she could talk. She walked out with a balloon in her hand from the mass general. Her Jewish doctor, Ronald Kleiner, a mass general, testified at the bat of it that he could not explain. Anyway, she was canonized. Pope John Paul II canonized her at the Vatican. The Stein family was there. All the Jew, Jewish fit, members of the Stein family, all of the Carthings were there. They had a wonderful uh, a meal together and so forth and so on. And the church in Brockton is now named St. Neil the Stein's parish. You know. So anyway, it's been a button to know Father McCarthy, because in 1982, he became a Catholic Melkite priest. He became a, not a Roman Catholic, but a Catholic Melkite priest in union with Rome. Uh, so he was ordained. He's been a priest 40 years. Uh, and uh, he has been a tremendous influence in my life. Tremendous influence on my life. So that's part of my story. And uh, that part of my story, too, is getting to know the chaplain, the, the, the Academy chaplain, who was chaplain to the crews that dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. His name is Father George Sabelka, and he was from Flint, Michigan. He's the only person I've ever heard to preach. Now, I go to Mass a lot in the 72 years of has been the brother. He's the only one I ever preached but who preached on Love Your Enemies. I did many a priest dodge it. Love your enemies. They, 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 they talk about something else. But he decided he was going to attack a lot like and do a superb job. So I've been very blessed to know these people along the way. And they shaped my life. That's a long winded answer to a short question, Scrutus. But I think it's, it's part of the, the whole story. wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what tradition was like back in St. John's when you were teaching. What was tradition like? Well, in 1956, when I arrived, September 56, we introduced suit coats and ties. Up until that time, uh, kids wore sweaters, uh, they could wear suit coats, or to shirt and tie, but the new principal or the chair decided that under his regime, we would go to suit coats and ties. Um, so St. John's has never been, you know, since 1898, a suit coat and tie school. But that's a, a tradition that was started because the chair had, it continues to this day. I can see that right now. The school day was probably 8.30 until 1.35 maybe. I forgot how long the periods were. But uh, the kids did not change classes. The teachers changed classes. So the kids sat in the same seats during the school day. Okay, So when the bell rang, the teacher left the classroom and they awaited another teacher to come into the to replace him. So that was something uh, kind of traditional back. I don't know when it changed over to, no, the kids change, the teacher stays, but that's the way it is today. Everybody uh, began the school, of course, with prayers. We don't, didn't have any loudspeakers there. So every uh, brother uh, started each class with a prayer. At the end of the day, all the students and the brothers said something called the three o'clock prayer. And it was a prayer that uh, the brothers had said throughout their history. And uh, 
And so the students would say the prayer. I th I, as I recall, the students kind of knelt on the, on the chairs um, to say the prayers, and they'd say it to the crucifix. I thank thee, O most amiable Jesus, that thou hast suffered a cruel, uh, ignominious death. But, uh, something like that, it, it began that way. There was no cafeteria, of course. Uh, everybody ate out in the schoolyard. On a very rare occasion, when it was really snowing, uh, we ate inside the school building, uh, up in the, um, the balcony of the bandbox gym that we had on Temple Street. It was a very, very small gymnasium. You could only set, seat one or two uh, rows of people on either side of the gym. Very, very small. Um, but occasionally, um, even Brother Chad uh, relented and said, okay, boys, you're going to eat indoors. But most of the time, everybody ate outdoors. Um, and we had a um, bike's lunch. It was like a, uh, a, uh, a cart, a, uh, a lunch cart that he, he drove up and parked it in the, the um, schoolyard. And kids would go and, and buy sandwiches. Most kids have brought lunches, you know, br brown bag lunches, you know. They might get a drink uh, from Mike. Then Mike retired, and then um, another fellow took his place, Louie. Louie and his wife uh, took over from Mike's lunch, and he was a very, very wonderful fellow. And he came out to Shrewsbury uh, when the... Um, student body moved to Shrewsbury in 1962. So that's, that gives you a little sense of what, what life was to fight down there. All right, but so, oh, do you want us to tell a little, us a little bit about the classes that you taught and how you kind of structured your lessons? Okay. Uh, when I arrived in September, on September 5th, 1956, I began my teaching career. And uh, the first class that I taught was in the old grammar school. Um, the grammar school building was a big building, and uh, it had eight grades. Uh, Mr. Gregory, Mr. Stephen Gregory, was a student there in the grammar school when I uh, was teaching in the high school. There was, uh, in the basement, they had a uh, cafeteria of the grammar school, and there was one classroom for the high school uh, it was a windowless classroom that the kids called the dungeon, okay? So the very first class I taught at Temple Street was in the dungeon, and there were 46 students in the dungeon. And uh, I was teaching Latin one, first year Latin. And uh, the first person on my list was Abdella Charles, who is the father of the present Mr. Abdella, who teaches here at St. John's. The last name on the list, number 46, was White, comma, William, who is the father of Mr. William White, who teaches English here, presently at St. John's. So I go, go way back. Uh, and they were wonderful kids, wonderful kids. Uh, I also taught uh, religion. Every brother taught religion. And uh, I taught English. And it was all with freshmen. The next year, 19, uh, 1957 58, I taught freshman Latin, freshman. English, freshman religion, sophomore modern European history, and biology. So I had five different preparations. I was uh, not particularly uh, uh, grounded uh, or steeped in any one of those subjects. My major in college was United States history, and with a minor in Latin American history, 
So, um, but I, I like the European history, modern European history. And uh, I remember a, one of the brothers from Baltimore came to supervise our classrooms. I have the, uh, the supervision report because Mr. Gregory found it up in the archives and he brought it to me about two or three weeks ago. And uh, Brother Burton, Brother Burton Manning was, a, uh, was the supervisor. He had taught one year at St. John's the year before I arrived. But he was always in school administration. He was always the headmaster or something, or the principal or something, or the supervisor of something. But in 1955-56, he taught at Temple Street. And uh, he was an opposing figure, uh, very, very big. And uh, you didn't mess around with Brother Brett. Or at least that's what the kids thought. Anyway, he sat in all classrooms and wrote up reports. And the report he wrote up on me was that he listed all the subjects that I just listed. And he said something like, he's way over his head in biology. And uh, he needs uh, uh, constant supervision, okay? In, in, in other words, the principal, Brother Chad, should sit in, in my classes to see if I was sinking or swimming. But uh, when I think back of it, back at it, I say to myself, how did I even do it? You know, I mean, it was a luck and a promise. Uh, Brother Bill will tell you that he had me in Latin, and I don't think I, be, I confess to him, and he acknowledges that I wasn't a very good Latin teacher. Well, that wasn't my subject. You know, I didn't major in Latin. I had Latin, uh, when I went to high school, and uh, the same with biology. I had what? I had no science in high school, none. No physics, chemistry, or physics, or uh, biology. I had one freshman biology class in college. On uh, that basis, I taught biology at St. John's, but I was taken out of the biology class, you know, and given something else. I took other English classes. So anyway, that's, that, that was it. Uh, we started off every morning here. Uh, we woke up around five o'clock and uh, we went to the chapel and we had a morning prayers and then a half hour meditation. And then that was followed by mass. That was every morning, um, six days a week. On Sundays, we had to go down to St. Mary's to Mass because none of the priests could come to say Mass here because they had Mass in their own uh, churches. And I've already talked about Father Gil Gunn, Father Bernie Gil Gunn, and the great influence he had on me, but not only on me, but other brothers too. Um, but that, that, that started that day. I forget exactly when we left for St. John's, but it was probably quarter of eight. We had two Dodge station wagons. And, you know, in those days, there weren't any bucket seats. They were uh, seats that you can shove uh, three people in the front seat and three people in the back, because there's no dividers. So three brothers in the front, three brothers, uh, or two brothers in the front, Two brother, uh, three brothers in the middle, and two brothers at the end. I guess it's sick. Anyway, I rode, I rode looking out at the traffic behind me because the seat in the Dodge station wagon faced behind, you know, so I was looking at the drivers coming behind me. Uh, and we had uh, one of our freshmen who lived in Shrewsbury. Uh, uh, he, he was the dishwasher. So for four years, he washed dishes there. And uh, then he joined the brothers for a while. And uh, he uh, taught at the uh, Zaverian Brothers High School for a while. And he uh, went to Harvard. Eventually, he left the congregation and got married. But uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful kid. Wonderful kid. Um, but anyway, uh, one station wagon would come home right at the end of school because we had 
I was going to say elderly brothers, brothers in their 50s and 60s, but I was 23, so they looked kind of elderly to me. You know? uh, but they were all that elderly. Uh, now that I'm 89, I have a different view of life. Um, but anyway, uh, the other uh, uh, station wagon stayed down there for after-school activities. And many, many a day, we had intramural basketball. And so I often refereed uh, intramural basketball games and freshman basketball games. I, I wasn't uh, qualified. I didn't have a board certification to do a varsity JV games. But this Stephen Como, who was here, who was the principal up until uh, the year 2000 or so, he was board certified. He, he went out and uh, did basketball games in various uh, schools all around the area. Uh, but anyway, uh, after school, so there was basketball after school in this tiny gym. Uh, we had to squeeze in uh, intramurals between varsity practices and varsity games in this tiny gym that we had. So many of the interviews were either on Saturday or sometime when the, the varsity was going someplace at night and uh, what was not going to practice at the school. Uh, to get to football and baseball, uh, the field was, um, do you know where Lake Avenue is? Um, um, Lake Quint Sigamon, it's certainly, uh, there's one side of Lake Quint Sigamon, the Worcester side of Lake Quint Sigamon. Well, there's a street that runs off Lake Avenue. Uh, and right now, uh, there's a Greek Orthodox church there, very wonderful Greek Orthodox church, on what was the playing fields for St. John's. So we call the playing fields the Oval. So the Oval was where football practices took place, baseball practices, baseball games took place. We didn't have any hockey. Uh, we did have track, um, but anyway, kids would either walk from Temple Street to the Oval or hitchhike. They were all dressed in their uniforms and they had their thumbs out and people would stop and pick them up and drive them uh, close to the Oval, if not to the Oval itself. So that was a kind of difference uh, <laughs> sports were concerned around here. You really had to work to be uh, on a team. Uh, we weren't going to hand you with, you know, facilities on a silver platter. Uh, as I recall, well, I don't think we had any theater. I can't recall theater, maybe we did. Uh, there wasn't any art program. Uh, there was no music program, but I remember. We had kids who could play pianos and, and things like that, but you know, that would be solo stuff. Uh, but there was no organized uh, uh, piano thing. Uh, but everybody seemed contented. The tuition for the year when I got there was, I think was a hundred and twenty-five or a hundred and fifty dollars a year, a year. Uh, and there was a graduation fee, I think, of five extra dollars. Oh, and the science fee of five or ten extra dollars if you were taking the science. But uh, it was a bargain even in those days. And if kids went to St. John's uh, grammar school or lived in the parish, the parish paid the uh, tuition. So they came for free. So, uh, again, and there were lots of devotions. The church was right across the street from the school. So every uh, First Friday we had mass. And before First Friday, on the Thursday before First Friday, there would be confessions of the lower church, St. John's Church. And everybody could go over there for the confessions. We had the Novena of Grace. There were all kinds of uh, uh, religious devotions that was part of the, the, uh, the ethos, it was part of the, the uh, culture. Every kid, I mean, you look at the, uh, the little memory book 
that I have here. In 1956, uh, 57, I came at 57, 56. In June of 57, there were 72 graduates, 72 graduates, and I'll, we have many more today. So you could uh, multiply 72. We had about 400 kids at the school, you know. People started off in the freshman year and would drop out. Some would drop out or just flunk out. And sometimes, you know, you couldn't continue if you got uh, three, three failing grades for several semesters of marking periods. Well, so, uh, but it was, it, 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 we had a good spirit. It was a great spirit. I can remember the pep rallies we had before uh, uh, games. All the kids would, would pack into the gym. And we had a brother, he was a short brother, Brother Nelson, Brother Nelson Conway. And uh, he taught Latin. And he was a, uh, he was an old character. All the kids liked him. And he taught Latin. But he led the pep rallies, and they were a hoot. Yeah, they, uh, they were really funny. And uh, because we had male cheerleaders, we didn't have any girls, no Notre Dame Academy girls to, uh, to help us out. Uh, but that, the, the spirit was very, very good. At St. Peter's, St. John's football games, every th uh, Thanksgiving, they were, th they were great. They were held at Holy Cross. And that was quite a tradition. We had very many uh, championship uh, teams here. We had a coach by the name of Bob Devlin. And I was here. And he was famous for turning out winning teams. And kids would run through brick walls for him. They were, I mean, they were that tough, and he was that demanding. Um, but we had very good football, baseball, and basketball teams under his tutelage. The are so serious of memory book that you mentioned? Yeah, this, is, this, is, this was the, the yearbook. When I was at St. John's, when the senior graduated, we have 72 pictures uh, here of the, uh, of the uh, graduates, okay? And uh, four in a page. That's why I asked you to multiply 72, and this year was 72. And the faculty. The faculty was up here. Okay, there was the faculty. And the faculty consisted of 12 brothers. No lay teachers, 12 brothers. Mrs. Gregory came in 1958, so she was the first female that I know of that was involved with St. John's, and she was the secretary. And we had a school chaplain, his name was Father Killian, but all the rest were brothers, okay? And uh, several of us are uh, you know, rather young looking, and we were young, so that uh, when it snowed and we had a, a day off from, from school, it was not a day off for the young brothers because, as I think I may have mentioned, we shoveled snow from the, the door here of the manor house out to the road. And it was, there were no snow clouds or whatnot. It was uh, muscle, muscle power. Uh, but it was a good, good, uh, I had five wonderful years here. I really did. I loved it. And I remember those years and the kids in those years very, very clearly, especially the first couple of classes. Now, what uh, the school year 1958-59 came, Brother Chad got a brilliant idea. He said instead of teaching three s separate sections of English and U.S. history in three separate classrooms, why don't we teach all the seniors at one time on the gym floor, teach them senior English and United States history all at once? So, that year, Brother Owen, Brother Owen Donahue, and I taught all the seniors at one time. And uh, he taught um, uh, English four, and I taught U.S. history, and there were a total of 69 seniors in the class. So there were 69 seniors spread out on the gym floor of the class. I have, I have a picture on that. Somebody took a picture 
of that class and had to take it in two sections. Uh, got up on the balcony, and uh, I guess it was a school photographer. You could see me teaching this side, and you could see all the others on this side. And, uh, but it was, Brother Owen and I said, it was one of the best classes we ever taught in our careers. The kids were terrific. You'd think maybe they were all gonna fool around and so forth, so forth. No, they were seniors. College was uh, on the horizon. They had to get good grades and whatnot. Um, and so they were just wonderful. Uh, I gave them term papers to write and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, that was, that was fat, fabulous. So I really enjoyed those, those classes. And I've often invited back to reunions of those early classes. In fact, sometimes they take me out to lunch. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, five to six or seven of them get together and say, we take a brother out to lunch, you know? And uh, it's just a great feeling. And I have great fondness and affection for all those, those kids who are now 80 years old, 79 or 80 years old. So they're no longer kids. Yeah. So, Joe, do you have a, any questions? I was actually going to ask, is there anything that you could tell us about some of your students that you were mentioning before? Well, of course, um, Charlie Abdello would be at the top, uh, one of the piece of people at the top. And um, he was a, a very, very good student, a serious student, uh, went on to Holy Cross, and uh, he uh, went to Boston uh, College Law School uh, under Father Drainan, famous Father Drainan, who uh, as a priest, became a member of Congress, representing this uh, uh, Boston district, the Newton area of, uh, around Boston. Uh, and uh, he's responsible for the Abdella lectures that we have here. In fact, we're having one uh, soon with David Gergen, who's a CNN uh, um, commentator and whatnot, and who worked for Ronald Reagan and the Bush uh, I think he worked for four presidents, but he's coming soon. But we've had some very, very good uh, people like uh, um, Helly Wiesel and uh, Paul Farmer and uh, Desmond Tutu, actually Desmond Tutu from South Africa. There's a whole, whole list. But he's responsible for bringing all of these people there. So I can remember him and, of course, Bill White. Bill, and Bill became a teacher back in 1964, so I've seen him forever, you know. He was our, our wonderful baseball coach. Uh, you know, I, I'm watching, watching uh, um, the um, World Series and the um, games before there were the division. Uh, and there's Ron Darling, who, um, who was a commentator for, uh, for the network. And... Uh, he was one of the stars here at St. John's. He was a very, very good professional baseball pitcher, and from the New York Mets especially. Um, but anyway, uh, Bill White is a very, very good teacher and a very good uh, uh, coach. So those two uh, stand out, and you know, the, you know, you don't want to mention too many people in the. Somebody will look at this and say, well, why didn't he mention me? <laughs> I, was, I was one of his favorites, so, so I, should, I should just stick with that first class, you know, the dungeon class. And, uh, uh, but there were so many, uh, Bernie Cody and uh, uh, Billy Shields, uh, so, so many. I don't want to go on and on, but uh, yeah, I remember them all very fondly. So, Nolan, you got any... Uh, so you want to tell us a little about how you saw um, high school life develop over time in different schools that you taught in? Okay, yes. Of course, uh, come 19, June of 1961, I left St. John's. There's a picture of me, uh, in fact, two pictures of me standing in front of signs saying uh, the site of St. John's Preparatory School uh, and that was taken by the Catholic Free Press, the diocesan newspaper. Somehow that, that wound up in our archives. So I have pictures of me standing there 
and the unfinished building looks as though it's finished, but you look down below and you can see it's not finished, uh, uh, of Connell Hall. Okay. So um, after I left St. John's, I went to Keith Academy in Lowell, and uh, I taught there for three years. I was back in biology. One of my dearest friends of the brothers, and the brothers, and I say that one of my dearest friends because I have so many dear friends. Uh, the brothers have been just absolutely perfect for me. So many of them have been dear, dear friends, and many of them, of course, have gone to glory. They're, 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 they're dead now. Well, when I left St. John's, I went to Keith Academy, and the headmaster up there, his name was Brother Joseph Gerard, Brother Joseph Gerard Tia. And uh, he welcomed me with open arms. And he said to me, uh, you may want to punch me in the nose. I don't think he said that, but that's what he meant. But here's your schedule. I can't help it. The guy who got transferred, this was his schedule. And, you know, it's like uh, St. John's. There's no wiggle room and there were no departments. So you had to teach multiple subjects, whether you knew them or not. So he said, you're going to teach religion. You're going to teach U.S. history to seniors. You're going to teach biology to seniors, but it's the lowest group, he said. So, you know, don't worry. Well, I think said, you're going to teach English, British literature. I said, I don't know anything about British. I mean, I had it in high school. You know. He said, I will teach you every night. You want to come to my room? He said, you're a bright boy. You can, you can, you can uh, I'll teach you and you can wait to teach me them. And so that's what we did. And you know what? It wasn't bad at all. I learned so much. Brother Joseph Trod was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant as an English teacher and as a human being, you know, and as a, as a, uh, a star pitcher for Mission High School when he was, uh, was in high school. Well, I was only with him one year, and he got transferred to St. John's High School here in Shrewsbury. He replaced Brother Chad. So he started here in 1963, I guess it was. So, but that's when I taught it at Keith Academy. Then, and, and it was more or less the same, you know, more or less the same. Oh, one of the classes I had was a religion class. Uh, junior religion, 3A, I guess, or what, whatever it was called. But anyway, I was all excited because I had started a master's degree. We couldn't start master's degrees for five years, okay? You couldn't get a bachelor's degree and then go into a master's degree. First of all, there were too many brothers that were, uh, we couldn't afford that. And when you got a master's degree in those days, you could have had, had to go summer after summer after summer, you know? We're too poor to just say, okay, you got the year off, uh, here's two years, go and do it. So, but I started in 1961 at Catholic University of America. I had switched from U.S. history to theology, thanks to Father Bernie Kilgun, changing my, my outlook on life. What do, we, what do you really want to teach? And so that's what I, so I come back from the first summer school session from Catholic University, and I had two fantastic uh, Bill Kilt scholars from the classes. So I came back and I said, we're going to do the Bible. We're going to do the Bible. So uh, I got permission to get s some of these pamphlets that uh, had the text of the Bible and commentary. So we did, I think it was Mark's Gospel or Matthew's Gospel, maybe Acts of the Apostles with the kids. Well, the kids were great. And at Christmas time, it's the only big, uh, big present I ever received. I received a, a card. I still have it. It was a keeper, you know. Everybody signed the card, and the message was, uh, uh, please use this check to further your biblical studies. 
and it was a check for I think twenty five bucks. But a twenty five bucks in nineteen sixty three or four was something. And I never forgot it. And when we had a reunion a couple of years ago, fiftieth reunion for that class up in Lowell, I produced out of my pocket the card and I said, If it wasn't for you, maybe I wouldn't have finished. Maybe I wouldn't have finished. I was so deeply moved, and I kept that card. As I say, it's a keeper. <laughs> uh, then I moved on to Keith at uh, uh, the Severe Brothers High School in 1964. Uh, As the first vice principal of the school, the school was just starting up, and the provincial said to me, uh, Brother Marcellus wants you uh, for his vice principal. Uh, so, in those days, you said, Yes, sir, <laughs> and do what you're told. So I started uh, as a, the vice principal there. And uh, I taught one religion class, but I didn't have time during the day to teach uh, anything else. I stayed there for three years, then I went and taught in our college in Silver Spring, Maryland. I think I mentioned that. I taught theology there. The college closed. I came back to the Zavarian Brothers High School and taught religion from that time on until 1986, and uh, 1986, I went to Manchester, England for a year and uh, uh, stayed at our, our school in Manchester, it's a very college, it's called in Manchester, and worked with a group of young men who uh, were giving a year of their lives following their own uh, graduation from colleges and universities. They were going to give a year of their lives to work with the poor of Manchester. And so we were forming a, uh, like a Christian community, five or six uh, young men living with the English brothers, the English brothers, to me, the American. And there was another group in Liverpool, and they were, uh, they were, uh, had the same kind of uh, uh, program. Uh, that, that was run by the Irish Christian brothers in Liverpool. And we used to get together once a week, you know, we'd go to, they would come from Liverpool to Manchester, or we'd go to Liverpool. And it was great. It was a community building thing, and everybody's doing the same thing. And it was one of the greatest years I ever spent. You know, I wasn't teaching it at the school. I couldn't because I, would, I, was, uh, I didn't have a work permit to teach in England. But I lived with the community, and I worked with the formation program of these these two groups. So that was wonderful. Then I came, then during that year, uh, uh, Brother James Boyle became the uh, provincial and he said, you're, you're coming, you're going to be my assistant provincial, my vice provincial. I said, I don't think I'm uh, qualified for that. He said, yes, you are. And if you say no, I'll be on the first plane over and uh, drag you by the hair of the head across the Atlantic Ocean. You're coming. To live with me at the Milton. So that, I, I was the vice provincial for two years, and then, lo and behold, we had what's called a, a general chapter, a general meeting of the whole congregation in Bruges, Belgium. And who got elected as the superior general? Brother James Boyle. And everybody was clapping, I was clapping, and he, he came off the, uh, the stage, and I came straight to me and said, Congratulations. And I said, Congratulations for, for what? He said, you're, right. you're, the, you're the new provincial. Huh? You're the new provincial. I, did, I didn't want to be the provincial, but I, I served out that year, and I really didn't want to stand for election, but brothers prevailed upon me to be stand for election. I stood for another two. So I served for, as a provincial for four years. So then... After I was provincial, I went to England for six months, studied at King's College London, and lived at our house in Twickenham, which isn't far from Heathrow Airport. And then uh, I went back to teach at Severe Brothers High School. I did that for two years. I shouldn't have done that. I, you know, things had changed, and I had changed, I guess. But anyway, I got a job. I was asked to be... Uh, the uh, director of religious education programs, school, high schools, high school chaplains, uh, campus ministry programs in high school for the Archdiocese of Boston. 
And I did that for a couple of years. And then um, the, um, the person in charge of uh, uh, education, Sister, uh, Sister uh, Ann Dominic, uh, she retired and I retired at the same time. Okay. And so I came here. My first love was uh, St. John's at Temple Street. And we were closing down the brother's house in Westwood, so we all had to move. And Brother Carlos said to me, why didn't you come up to Shrewsbury? You like Shrewsbury. All your old boys are up here. So I've been here 22 years. So that's, that's, that's the whole story. <laughs> that's the whole story. So, Brother Paul, you were talking to us a little bit after our recording last week about how you were participating in the Curcio. Do you think you could tell us a little bit about what you did in that and what exactly the Curcio is? I lived the Curcio in 1967. And it's a four-day retreat. It's designed for men, and there's a separate one designed for women. I've been involved after I lived the Curcio in 1967. I was uh, involved in the Northern Virginia Curcio and also the Richmond Virginia Curcio. I got involved up here in the year 2000. One of the, uh, one of the deacons that I had taught in the diaconate program died and after the mass, instead of going straight to, to the, uh, the cemetery to bury the body, everybody was invited downstairs to have some coffee and sandwiches and whatnot. And while I was downstairs, a deacon by the name of Dan Sullivan, and I had taught, called me over to, to meet a priest. His name was Father Joe Callahan. Holy Cross priest stationed at on Stonehill College, although he was not a professor in Stonehill. And Father Callahan asked if I would be interested in getting involved in the Curcio down at Stonehill College, the Holy Cross retreat house. See, every time I went in to teach permanent deacons, the first class for years, I said to the men, how many of you have lived the Curcio? And a few hands would go up. And then I would always say, everybody should live for Curcio. So uh, that's why Dan Sullivan remembered that and introduced me to, uh, to Father Joe Callahan. So uh, I started in the year 2000 down there. And uh, last week, I finished my 42nd Curcio down at uh, Stonehill. It was a men's Curcio. And, uh, it's just been a, a wonderful experience. In 1969, I had to do a master's degree thesis in theology down at the Catholic University of America. And I was supposed to do a, a, a paper on a biblical theme, but the professor who was a priest left the, left the priesthood. So I had to get another advisor. The priest who was running the program at the time, who was in the summer, summer program, said, well, I'm not really a scripture person. I'm a liturgy person. He said to me, what are you interested in? What are the things that uh, interest you? And I said, well, I, you know, I'm involved with the Curcio. Oh, the Curcio. Uh, he said, nobody's ever done a thesis on the theology underlying the Curcio. So that's your topic. So I completed a master's degree uh, on the other Curcio. It was started in Spain after the Spanish Civil War. During the Spanish Civil War, thousands of people were killed on both sides of the conflict. It was a within the country, a civil war. And one side had lots of Catholics. Spain is a very Catholic country. And on the other side, there were lots of Catholics. So here we had a situation, a political situation, where Catholics were killing Catholics. 
And the Pope lamented the fact that these people don't seem to understand what Christianity is all about. So these young people said, we like to do something to see if we can revive Catholicism because Spain is spiritually dead. It's spiritually decimated. So these young people organized a big pilgrimage and they went to St. James of Capistello, which is, I believe, up in the Pyrenees Mountains. It's a big climb. There was a movie made uh, oh, about 20 years ago called The Way. So it's a story of um, his father, who, uh, who has been devastated by his son's early death, deciding to make a pilgrimage because his son wanted to go on this pilgrimage. Oh, it's the story of the people who meets on the pilgrimage and finally getting to the shrine. It's a, it's a good tale. These young people uh, got in touch with a Spanish bishop by the name of Juan Urbas. And together, they put together a very well-constructed four-day retreat consisting of many talks, many discussions of the talks, poster drawings of the talks, reports of the, the talks, lots of fun in between, lots of singing, lots of rejoicing. It's hard to explain because there are certain experiences you just can't e explain until you go through that experience. As I say, I've been in, on many, many crusades. We have three, three spiritual directors. I'm one of the spiritual directors, a Holy Cross priest, Father Jim Darty, and this last uh, retreat I was on, uh, Father Jim Mahoney, who is a pastor in a uh, Catholic church in Burlington. We give spiritual talks, and they're all, they all deal with the topic of grace, God's gift and our response to God's gift. I've never met anybody who uh, walked out of the Crusade. And these are men who come from all walks of life. We had a former chief of police on this last one, uh, two state troopers on this last one, uh, a plumber, a uh, carpenter. They come from various, uh, we've had doctors, we've had lawyers, we've had all kinds of people, you know, janitors. It's a very moving experience. Two of our faculty members that I know of, uh, Mr. William White, who teaches English here and plays the guitar at masses, uh, he has lived the Criseo, and Mr. Greg Blondin, who is a computer uh, teacher, uh, he's lived the Criseo, so you can always ask them uh, about the Criseo too. So that's basically what the Criseo is all about. It's one of the greatest things that I've done in my life to be involved in my own small way with, with Chrissy. I got involved in the private diaconate program in the Boston Archdiocese in 1973. That was a big year for me because not only was I teaching high school during the day, but one night during that during the week, I was teaching uh, at a manual college, the the graduate program on the Old Testament. Another night in the week, I was out teaching CCD teachers. We did that at Aquinas Junior College in Newton, and then the third night of the week, I started teaching the. Permanent Deacons. Permanent Deacons is a, an order in the church that was restored from Vatican II. Uh, it consists mainly of married men who want to serve the church in a liturgical way, in, but mainly in a service way. So they are really servants of, uh, of the Lord. is an, a, a um, description in Acts of the Apostles where seven men are called to be servants, deacons, and they are ordained. But their job was not to administer the sacraments. Their job was to, to serve the poor and the widows 
and the orphans and what not among the Christians. But the Yakinet in Boston started at St. John's Seminary. So that's where I, I used to teach at the seminary. I sat in 1973 and I taught in the program, the Old Testament uh, course, up until the year 2012. From 1973 to 2012, they didn't always take you in the class every year. In other words, some years they took in one class, then another class the next year, and then some years they, oh, they skipped a year. And then there was a period when I was the provincial and the vice provincial. My work was so, so heavy that I couldn't teach. But once I got out of the provincial aid, then I went back teaching the Old Testament. In this diocese, the Worcester diocese, uh, we have graduates of St. John's High School who are permanent deacons. You remember our funeral mass for Brother Connell that we had back in May? Um, one of the persons who served at the altar was a, a permanent deacon, uh, Paul Convino, his name is. He's the campus minister at Assumption University. But we, all, we also have other graduates from the school. Um, Ray Hayes, he, he was at uh, Temple Street when I was at. I think he was in the class of 58, 57, or 50, 1958. We have uh, Ed Melius, he's a graduate. Colin uh, Novick, is a, is a graduate, but uh, we had at least five uh, people serving the, di the Diocese of Worcester who were permanent deacons. It's been a joy. Now, every year since 1995, with the, expect that with the exception of the COVID years, I used to give an annual retreat to deacons who had already been ordained. Uh, they, uh, deacons have to make the retreat, so they can make it anywhere, but in 1995, we uh, started, uh, people asked me to, to organize a weekend retreat, Friday, Friday night to Sunday noon. Um, and I would give five talks on a particular uh, topic. And the retreat uh, drew sometimes 25, 30 deacons. Sometimes it would be down to 18, you know, by mid might make 35. It all depended. They, they had their choice for it. So there were people who would come every year. I called them my groupies. So uh, I would never repeat a retreat, you know, one and done. That was it. So every year I had to come up with a different theme, five different talks, so forth and so forth. But it was, it's been the joy of my life. It really has. Um, Teaching high school has been wonderful, but uh, all these other outside activities have been terrific too. So I hope that some of the boys at St. John's will be taught about the permanent diaconate. Would it, maybe would a teacher would invite one of the permanent deacons who, who is a graduate of the school to come in and, uh, and um, make a presentation. But yeah, the permanent deacon that, that part of my life is, is very, very important. It's a blessing. God has blessed me. Do you think you could give us maybe a little bit more insight into your life living with the brothers after your career with the pig was over? Well, in 1986, I went to uh, England. I, I think I may have mentioned this. I went to Manchester, England, where we had a high school in England they called Carlton's. Uh, so it's a very college, Manchester. And I worked with uh, young men who were giving a year of their lives of service, of service to the poor of Manchester. I lived with the brothers, the English brothers, and the, and the volunteers. And it was a wonderful experience. I still hear from one of them. He's still working with the Jesuits. He's married and working with the Jesuits. He's probably zeroing in on 60. <laughs> so. Uh, and another one of them became a priest. He's a diocesan priest in England. Uh, so that was 1986, 1987. Then uh, I did not go back to teaching. I went and became the vice pr uh, provincial of the American Northeast province. And then I became the provincial of the province up until 1993. And then in 1993, uh, I went 
on a sabbatical and went back to England. We had a house outside London, the uh, Heathrow Airport, I was our general headquarters, and I lived there for six months and took two courses at King's College, London, which is located right downtown on the Strand and the Thames River. Then I went back to high school for two years. Then a job came open to the Catholic school office, okay? And the Catholic school office wanted me to be the director of the 36 high schools, the Archdiocese of Boston, as far as religion was concerned. So religious programs, priest chaplains, campus ministry programs, all were on the way in Rowan. So I did the programs for them, got speakers there, went to schools and uh, talked to the uh, members of the department. The superintendent of Catholic schools retired in 2000, and I retired in 2000. When she left, I left. Then I moved here, St. John's. Now, all the time I was doing this, of course, I was living in commuter. There was, I never lived by myself. You know, there are some brothers who, of necessity, because of the work they do, live by themselves or live with a priest in a rectory. We were brother down in Brooklyn, New York, and does that. Uh, but I've always lived in community. That is one of the blessings, the great joys of my life. When I got to the novitiate, I didn't know anybody. I never went to a Severian school. After one week at Fort Monroe, Virginia, or our old point comfort, Virginia, I knew this is where God wanted me. God wants everyone to be happy. God wants everyone to um, find his place. I think that that's what I've, I've never been tempted to leave. You know, I've never said, oh, I think uh, this, this religious life is too much. I know I would have made, uh, I think I would have made a, a, a very good husband. And uh, I think I would have made a very good father. And I think I would have made a terrific grandfather. But those things are, were out of the cards. If you want to serve the Catholic Church, you've got to promise celibacy. Brothers, hymns, and priests. Um, although there are some married priests. I mentioned Father Emmanuel Charles McCarthy, who was in the Melkite Rite and was married with 12 kids and had three kids after his ordination. You know, it wasn't that he had to have all the kids before he was ordained to the priesthood. No, he had three kids after he was ordained to the priesthood. But the thing that, that makes religious life uh, a joy is the people you live with. And one of the things you, lo you learn about living with people is no two people have the same ideas. No pe two people have the same personalities. Uh, you're not join, joining a bunch of clones. You know, when I first came to St. John's, there must have been five brothers that were probably in their 50s, 60s. And there were like three, four of us who were in our 20s. So all the way along the line, I've had to live with older people and younger people, you know. And somehow we're able to negotiate our differences. You know, I've never had any arguments with people about uh, Politics, we're not allowed to really argue about politics. It's a sad, sad portion of our history. We call it sinful history of the Zaverian brothers. Brothers, uh, there, were, there are quite a few houses in Louisville, and some of the brothers were German, uh, German leaning, and some were French. And um, the, the Dutch, but people took sides in the Franco-Prussian War. And they had bitter arguments at table in Louisville. So bad was it that a number of brothers left the, left the congregation that joined other writers. And from that point on, we said, politics is a forbidden subject. It's a dividing subject. So we don't argue about politics, and, and we try to, to live as brothers. That's why we're called brothers. It's just not a title. Try to, to uh, live as if this way you're blood, blood bro. You know? As I say, we do have our differences. Some people like baseball, some don't. You know, uh, Some like to play tennis, others don't. But we all kind of work together. 
you're tiny. Small things grow. That's a motto we have. But it's always been great. It's always been great. But I came here in the year 2000. I was welcomed with open arms. Brother Kylo drew me here because he knew I was at Temple Street in my early career. But we had to leave Westwood because the community was dissolving. Our numbers had gone down, and the school wanted the brother's house. As the school now has the brother's house, the old brother's house is where all the counseling offices and uh, what, where Mr. Sakara has his office. That, that used to be the brother's residence. And uh, so that's, yeah, community life is the best. I'm Joe Carpenter, class of 2023, and I'm Nolan Pace, class of 2024. And on behalf of the St. John's Network, thank you for watching our interview with Brother Paul. We'd like to thank him for lending us some of his time to share with us his life story. Additionally, we'd like to thank Brother Paul for giving us some insight into the history of St. John's and the communities built both in the student body and in the Severian Brothers. On behalf of everyone involved in this production, we would like to extend a special thank you to Kevin Kwasney for his efforts in directing, producing, and filming this project. Once again, thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed the St. John's Network production.